Today we're in Psalm chapter 16. Before we get to verse 1, though, there's another superscription. You'll notice, if you have an open Bible, at the very top of this psalm that reads, A Mechtam of David. Now, there are six psalms with this same heading. The meaning of Mechtam is, is kind of hard to nail down. Hebrew scholars are, are somewhat divided. Some believe it's a, it's a musical term of some sort. Others believe that it means to engrave, so let's take it literally. This is David wanting to engrave the truths of this psalm on the hearts of his people. What we do know is that every one of these six psalms were written when David was facing difficulty and hardship and even danger. Now, David doesn't tell us what this danger is, but this psalm opens with a prayer related to this difficulty here in verse 1, where David prays, Preserve me, O God. Well, that's his prayer. It's a short one. You know, it's a reminder that God doesn't require a lot of words, just a, an open, transparent heart. David then goes on here to remember in verse 6 that he has a beautiful inheritance ahead of him. And on the way to that inheritance, David delivers this amazing prophecy in verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Sheol is that Hebrew word that refers broadly to death. It's the place of the dead. It's, it, it's the graveyard. Now, through some means, maybe through Nathan the prophet, the Lord has assured David that the danger he's experiencing isn't going to, to take him to the cemetery. It isn't, going to, it isn't going to end his life. So this psalm essentially ends with, well, David's living to, to fight another day. But now, uh, follow this with me. Over in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter's preaching, that opening uh, a sermon that begins the church, and he applies this verse here in Psalm 16 to the resurrection of Jesus. So Peter sees Jesus' empty tomb as the fulfillment of David's words here. God will not allow his son to remain in the grave to experience the corruption, the decay that follows death. So David is actually speaking prophetically of his descendant, we refer to as the son of David, the Lord Jesus. Jesus is going to destroy the power of death and the grave. He's going to give to his followers everlasting life. So, so David is looking forward to a resurrected Savior. You and I are looking backward at that same resurrection. And by faith in the risen Savior, we are now heading for this glorious inheritance, which is life beyond the grave. What a great promise. When I hear in Psalm 17, David is being falsely accused. We're not told what the accusation is, but he's, he's about to pray here for God to do something about it. Now, maybe you felt the same pain David's felt. You have the same pain perhaps in your heart today as, as you're praying to the Lord like David does here in, in verse 10. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They've now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Now maybe you hear me read that and you're saying, yeah, David, I'm right here with you. Lord, confront my accuser, subdue him. Uh, but, but hold on, that's a fast. David isn't actually asking God to crush him or them. In fact, the word subdue here means to cause to bow down. David is actually asking God to make his accusers bow down in worship to the Lord. You know, that'd be like you and me today praying that our enemies would get saved. Lord, save them. Bring them to worship you along with us. <laughs> I got to tell you, that, that's not how I feel like praying for my enemies. I, I don't think I want them coming to church with me. I'm not going to save them a seat in the pew. I, I'd rather see them get, you know, squashed rather than saved and, and vindicate me in the process. Isn't that how we feel? 
So how do we develop a heart a lot more like David's here? Well, David gets this gracious perspective through the promise of a coming resurrection. He writes here in verse 15, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. You know, the assurance of his own future resurrection gives him that patient, gracious attitude toward others. See, when you and I realize that this life is really brief, (laughs) it's so brief, and our eternal life is just ahead, that's going to change the way we view people and the problems of life on the way there to our eternal life. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you get a call from the bank, and, and, and the banker tells you, you know, you need to come on down here and sign a form regarding an inheritance you've just received. It's an inheritance of $10 million. It's, it's going to be deposited into your bank account. You, you had no idea Uncle Henry was that rich. In fact, you had no idea Uncle Henry was going to leave you all his money and you should have gotten him, you know, a nicer Christmas gift if you'd just known it. Well, off to the bank you go. Suppose on the way to the bank, a guy pulls in front of you, and you've got to swerve out of the way. You're going to honk at him? You're going to trail him for the next two miles, you know, yelling at him? No. You're going to the bank. Then you pass somebody you recognize from work. It's somebody that doesn't like you, and you've pretty much tried to stay out of their way. Well, he looks over at you, and, and what are you going to do? You find yourself smiling and waving at him. Well, how in the world did that happen? You're on your way to the bank. And then all of a sudden, your car lurches over, and you got a flat tire. And while you're out there in the hot sun changing that flat tire, are you asking God why he allowed this difficult delay and how tough God is and how rough he's been on your life? No. Not at all. You're thanking God for what's just ahead at the bank. You see, recognizing what's just ahead of us in heaven, that has a way of changing our attitude along the way. You know, we tend to forget our inheritance in that city of gold, don't we? Surrounded by the glorious presence of God and the singing of the redeemed. I mean, this is just a head down the road. That, that affects our attitude as we press on. Now, I want to look briefly at Psalm 18. Now, we're given a, a long superscription here at the beginning that says this, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, that's a long superscription, and and it needs to be because it tells us that this psalm is going to cover a span of time almost 40 years long. This is a, a memorial of praise to God for deliverance time and time again over the course of David's life. And David sings here as it opens in verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer in whom I take refuge I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Did you notice that all these verbs are in the present tense? I love you, O Lord. I call upon you, Lord. I am saved from my enemies. You see, David's testimony isn't all about way back then when he was a little boy or when he was a young man, you know, uh, defeating Goliath or even 30 years later. His testimony, as yours and mine should be, is as fresh and meaningful today in the present as much as it was in the past. Now, David describes here God's deliverance in verse 10. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. Again, down here in verse 19. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Now, we know, of course, that deliverance doesn't always arrive immediately, didn't do that for David, doesn't do that for you or me. And that's because God is more interested in developing us than he is in immediately delivering us. Well, so it seems that way, doesn't it? Maybe you're waiting on him today. But when your eyes are on the future and you're you're thanking God 
for your future, that day when when it finally arrives and, and you sign the papers, so to speak, on your eternal inheritance, the world isn't nearly as distracting or troubling as it was. See, after almost 40 years, this is David's testimony. He failed, he sinned, he confessed, he waited, he was discouraged, he pressed on, and eventually he did see his Lord face to face. So let's live a little more like David today. That means when you get cut off in traffic or, or you get a flat tire out there in the hot sun or your enemies seem to you know, keep getting the upper hand, you keep pressing on. You, you keep moving forward. You're closer to home than you know. Well, until our next Wisdom Journey, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.